Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the Gnome Show After Dark. I'm your host, Josh. Um, it's nice to see you guys again. Um, I don't know how long I'm going to be on, just maybe just for a little while, but um, Mr. Doss is in the house. and Shh, Don't encourage him. <laughs> <laughs> So, uh, not only do I have some distraction, uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, but there's also um, um, an, a, a, a second... Another crazy person to talk to? A secondary opinion. Uh, <laughs> uh, um, uh, a contradiction to my own uh, noise and chaos. <laughs> This crazy guy in the My background. dulcet tones. Uh, <laughs> I mean, uh, uh, hi. So tonight, um, I'm gonna do. We're gonna watch a couple of things uh, in the spirit of um, keeping things from putting us both to sleep. <coughs> Is it a murder love scene? No, actually, it's about the other guy, Pepsi. Wait. Um, Pepsi. Pepsi. Oh, Pepsi. Sitting here, I'm like, um, what do you mean by Pepsi? Are they your Pepsi? Dude? No. no. Uh, run away! Run away! And there was much rejoicing. Mm. Yay! <laughs> <laughs> we would like a shrubbery. <laughs> what? A shrubbery. We demand another shrubbery. Oh, no, no. And Remember, your father smells like elderberries. Uh, your mother was a hamster and your father smelt of elderberries. <laughs> sure, catch a demush. Huh? Catch a demush. See, ladies and gentlemen, I don't need sound effects. I have John. Uh, <laughs> you're so sweet. Hey. Yeah, yeah, I don't need a soundboard. I don't need a mixer. I just have this guy just fucking give him some caffeine and he's good to go. <laughs> yeah. Oh, look at that. Uh, the new PC is running nice and smooth. 44 degrees. <coughs> and Josh is dying. <laughs> <laughs> oh, dabs will do it to you along with the cold. God damn. The gnome is about to hit. Uh, uh, uh. Not today, sir. Not today. Lies. <laughs> so, John, if you'll notice, I now have a uh, a scroll across the bottom of the screen where I can inject <laughs> <laughs> your ads. No, um, there's actually um. Kind of seeing if anybody's paying attention, but you know. It's about a completely empty cemetery. That's the second round so far. I change them up uh, uh, every so often. And today for the news. Right? <laughs> Nobody's having sex in a cemetery. Dear God. What is this world coming to? Well, there's a grand opening of a hotel. They're offering the first night free. That doesn't stop people from screwing in a cemetery. You do it because it's fun. Depends on what reality you're in. I'm in this reality. In that one, not so much. Which one's that one? The one where you have a big giant head, and look, even your uh, even your little mascot there has a similar sized beard as you, but darker glasses. I mean, and a hat that's pointy. Yours is rounded. Give me time. You're like a golfer's hat. No, oh, it's a it's a. Does it clip in the front? No, when it's a, it's, it's one of the hat. it's one of those. But it's not an Irish hat. It's a freaking golfer's hat. Whatever. I yeah. Whatever. Little beard. <laughs> <laughs> Whatever you say, big beard. <laughs> yeah. 
We shall name him Little Beard. <laughs> that's how we. That's how you know we're brothers. <laughs> oh my goodness! <laughs> yeah, yeah I, I'm, I'm telling you, they're not going to be able to, soon, and they're not going to be able to tell us apart. You need to like, you need to get like, you don't even have to shave it. Just get like a number two mm-hmm. or a number one, and wear a hat, and you'll. It'll really fuck with Jonathan. <laughs> well, I was planning on shaving my head at some point in time because my hair is getting way too long for me to deal with. I'm quite literally uh, about to start freaking out how long. I do keep hinting is. at it. I do keep. I keep saying, you know. Fucking up. Yeah, just cut that shit. Just, just cut it. Just, just cut it. Like every time somebody walks through the door, I'm sitting there like pushing my hair, hair out of my face, like okay. And people just all they see is me doing this. <laughs> and they're like, did I interrupt something? I'm like, no, no, no. I'm just getting my hair out of my face. Everyone, Jed, uh, John is having trouble getting rid of his fantasy haircut. Fantasy? <laughs> More like dreadful. N- no, uh, you know, one of those hairstyles they have in the uh, content or the character creators for like new characters. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> My hair is long, it's supple, it's thick, <laughs> and it's brown. <laughs> now, if it was purple, then, you know, I, I'd probably keep it. And uh, unfortunately, it's making him look like a hobo. Or a whore. I don't know. <laughs> However, you know, some people, you know, hey, look. Tomato, tomato, right? No shame here. No shame in the game. I mean, oh, uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> on that wonderful note right. let's um let's and how you doing viewer nice to see you tonight um we're gonna jump into the first one uh and um this is uh pepsi's 32 billion dollar typo that killed five people oh sweet shit yes sir so let's uh pepsi does not dissolve rats <laughs> wait <laughs> Let's go ahead and bring, um, there's the TV room. Uh, yes, right there. <coughs> okay, ladies and gentlemen, let's, uh, let's see how badly Pepsi fucked up. Well, that's a little you know, bit of an excessive. When I think about Pepsi versus Coke, I'm reminded of the words of the late philosopher Norm Macdonald. Coca-Cola is a delicious drink. And people, see, they think in their minds that if your favorite drink in the entire world is Coca-Cola, then your second favorite drink will be Pepsi-Cola, which is flawed reasoning. Actually, if your first favorite drink is coca-cola your least favorite drink is pepsi cola i think that's a sentiment shared by most people and that's not an opinion the numbers do not lie coke's market share is almost double that of pepsi and for that reason pepsi has historically done some really wacky things to try to get a leg up on their competitor but one time they took it too far and plunged an entire country into chaos a marketing stunt in the early 90s led to months of violent riots that left five people dead. But to really understand how we got to that point, we gotta go back. What we do here is go back, 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 back. In 1902, Caleb Bradham formed the Pepsi Cola Company, kicking off one of the most brutal and long standing wars in history the Cola Wars. Due to an early advantage, Coke has Such been dominating the Cold Wars for over a hundred years. I'm sure everywhere. the fact that they used to put I'm actual sure cocaine in their everywhere. beverages did not hurt at all. Now here's the thing, Pepsi knew they could never compete on the taste Dr. front because uh, their product tastes Dr. like Dr. diarrhea you know, water yeah. mixed with sugar, and they know it. So historically, <laughs> they've Dr. had Bloods to resort here. to high profile celebrity endorsements and marketing gimmicks to move their product. And over the years, they've had some absolute banger ad campaigns, like the famous Pepsi Challenge, where contestants would try both Coke and Pepsi without knowing which was which. And they, I can absolutely fucking tell the difference between uh, Coke and Pepsi. There's no, there's, there's, there's no question. Um, 
uh, Pepsi's always been like uh, it's it's just like drier than Coke. Oh, I don't know. I freaking... It's 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 like I, I can't really tell the difference because both of them hurt, make my my make my face hurt. Drink a little bit of it, and even the fizz just get get caught in my nose. Well, because I, it's been broken so many times. It's just like tears. Well, we also know that you're an extremist, so there's after every chance that uh, uh, that you just take the can and just slam it against your head and hope that some of it gets in your mouth. Uh, no, it's, that's what I do when I uh, I go to crush it and I just <laughs> ha ha. But it's a, it's supposed to be empty when you do that. Empty, full, whatever. Impact trauma, John. <laughs> Asshole. Need I say more? I have no teeth. <laughs> yeah. It's not like I can freaking just gum it to that. <laughs> <laughs> That's why you get the jaws implants, and then we just like, hey, John, we need to. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Bite chose Pepsi every time. Coca Cola says it's the real well, thing, well. but Pepsi Cola believes that when it comes to colas, the only real thing is taste. That's, That's why the Pepsi Stadium. Challenge has been asking thousands of people across the country to let their own taste decide. And the fact is, nationwide, more people prefer the taste of Pepsi over Coca Cola. Pepsi. It's Pepsi. Pepsi. I like Pepsi a lot better. Pepsi tastes better. All right, guys. Lies. I, I have two vices in my life: nitrous oxide. And Coca-Cola, okay? I'm a Coke <laughs> head. I am a Coke fiend. So to me, it's inconceivable okay. that anyone would ever pick Pepsi in a blind taste test. So I decided to test this out for myself. I'm standing here in a non-disclosed parking lot. I'm and just I'm going to ask strangers to do a blind taste test to see if they That's prefer Pepsi don't or the me. competitor. So I, let's see if we can find I, a... I'm Sir, you! Everyone, so do you want to participate in a blind taste test? <laughs> All right, come on over. Come on over. All right, so here's how this is going to go. In one of these cups is Pepsi. In the other cup is their competitor. So you're going to try each one of them, and you're going to tell me which one you prefer, okay? So start with this one. This one right here? Yes, sir. Okay. Oh, that is disgusting. I don't like that. It's horrible. Try this one out, yeah? Yeah, that's not good either, but I prefer this one. I like that one better. I like this one better. Than <laughs> well, uh, let's see which one's which. Okay, so this one here is... Oh, yeah. Yep. This one's Pepsi. Okay. So that's the one you, you didn't like. Okay. Yeah, no, I, I didn't like it. Now, this one is piss. This is my this is my piss, actually. Yeah. What? Yeah, it's piss. Let me try this again. Okay, he's trying it again. <laughs> Yeah, that's piss. Well, there you have it, guys. <laughs> Pepsi is literally worse than human urine. Uh, thank you, sir, for, for participating in this. I really appreciate it. Yeah, sure, I guess. Oh, well. <laughs> He's going to take it. I really wasn't expecting that. It's, like, it's kind of crazy, actually. <laughs> Can I get sued for this? The Pepsi challenge <laughs> might not make sense to a cokehead like myself. But there's no denying that it's an absolute yeah, masterclass really in marketing. I remember learning about it when I was getting my advertising degree at DeVry University. It's one of the most successful and iconic ad campaigns of all time. Now, this is not to say that every ad campaign they did was a banger. Like, remember that one time Pepsi tried to end racism by having Kendall Jenner hand a Pepsi to a cop at a Black Lives Matter protest? <laughs> Like, I really don't. I have no intention that, of doing that, you know. When, I forgot about know. this until I started researching for this video. This was actually psychotic. Still better than Crystal cool. Pepsi, though. One of Pepsi's most successful ad Crystal campaigns Pepsi. ever was called yeah. Number Fever. That, that, it was that, basically that a lottery where if you got the right numbers on your bottle cap... There are still places in America where you can find original bottles of Crystal Pepsi just lying there because nobody will ever want them. They will be here until the sun fucking goes out. You could win some money. A lot of people are finding a lot of cash where they least expect it. Have a quarter, Mom, please, kid. Um. Thanks, Mom. A hundred bucks till payday? Right. 
It was a it was a hey, marketing see? ploy to get Look under uh, Pepsi caps to it, win it, up to $100 it was, cash instantly. And it saw a moderate amount of success in the, the United words. States. It was but one day, a bunch of executives were sitting around a table brainstorming how they could use this to exploit people in third world countries. So Number Fever was introduced to Latin America where it did extremely well. So much so that they decided to expand into other markets, namely the Philippines. Before we go there, let's do another quick history lesson. In 1898, the US went to war with Spain. And the reason for this war was uh, pretty sketchy, very false flaggy. But it doesn't really matter. What matters is that America kicked the shit out of Spain and took all their colonies, including the Philippines, which it held until 1946. Even though the US no longer occupied the Philippines on paper after that, we still maintained a large presence in the area and it became an important battleground during the Cold War. The CIA carried out a bunch of operations in the Philippines, including one where they literally staged a fucking vampire attack to scare <laughs> communist rebels. No, I'm not joking. This was a I think we also used um, uh, ghost voices and shit like that uh, uh, as well, like using oh, their... Oh um, my god. Yeah, Are like, um, yeah, yeah, using their local, oh, um, no, their no. local lore and suspicion, uh, uh, like uh, it's a, uh, superstitions against them, yeah. Like, uh, Real um, thing. But we also backed the dictator anybody, Ferdinand but, Marcos you know, who ruled like, with an iron area. fist for 30 years. You because know, of all that... Basic Scooby-Doo shit. You yeah. know what I'm saying? Like, there is no monster here, but we don't damn well make people think there is. <laughs> oh American culture was pretty pervasive in the Philippines. These people loved basketball, Michael Jackson, and most ah. importantly, good old-fashioned soda pop. Because after all, what's more American than diabetes? Coke had a presence in the Philippines since 1912, when it opened up its very first international <laughs> bottling plant in Manila, beating Pepsi to the punch by a whole 34 years. And it would continue to dominate all the way into the 90s. By 1992, Pepsi controlled a pathetic 17 percent of the philippine soda market and this was pretty significant because at the time the philippines was the 12th largest soft drink consumer in the world just like a middle-aged white man going through a midlife crisis pepsi was desperate to penetrate the philippines despite the locals finding them disgusting but everything would change when number fever came into town wait, wait, wait a second as, as, as i was saying Here's something new from Pepsi. You, you, you can cash this. Just buy any Pepsi product, look under their caps or crowns, you can win, 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 win. Uh, so don't I just walk, that. run, 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 and get your cash crowns now. By the way, I... Is this the one where, uh, the, was this the points one where that one kid fucking, like, uh, like, uh, like he won, like, the commercial they had the, the Harrier jet? Uh, that yeah. was a prize, and he fucking he he said fucking pony the fuck up. I have the points. <laughs> I apologize for the dog water quality of these clips. For some reason, it's like all of these points commercials are right? in like that. I remember so that commercial. I was like, Anyways, here's how number fever works. Under each cap of Pepsi, Seven Up, and Mountain Dew was imprinted a number from zero zero one to nine nine nine. Every night, locals would tune into the Channel Two News, where they would announce oh, the winning wow. numbers. And you could win anywhere from a hundred pesos to the grand prize of one million. A million pesos at the time is the equivalent to about seventy-five thousand U.S. today, which to us not privileged Westerners much. may not sound like a crazy amount. No, no, no. Give but it, to give, the give average it right Filipino here. Right here. who I'll only makes about exchange. four thousand bucks a year, not this now, was but... life-changing, <laughs> though. So millions of people across no, two thousand islands started that? buying up bottles on top of bottles up, to try and win that succulent million pesos. Some of them even chose to buy Pepsi instead of food. But just like any other lottery, the odds were not in their favor. It was oh, estimated wow. that the chances of winning the grand prize were somewhere around 1 in 28.8 million. Holy These odds hell. are so astronomically bad that there's a better chance of me not plugging a sponsored segment in this video right now. Hmm. So, uh... You guys ever hear about Morgan & Morgan? Are you in frequent legal trouble like I am? In the past few years alone, I've had to deal with a divorce, child custody hearings, 
tax fraud investigations, and bootleg DVD charges. And if there's anything I've learned dealing with all that stuff is that you need a good lawyer on your I'm side. That That's why I partnered with Morgan & Morgan for this video. They're America's largest injury law firm. Oh, they have over 1,000 so lawyers at the ready to represent you. And years. they're in every state of the United States of America. Now guys, take it from me. Finding a lawyer is a real pain in the tokens, but Morgan & Morgan makes it easy. If you ever get injured in an accident, you're just eight clicks away from submitting a claim. Morgan & Morgan has helped recover over $20 billion for their clients, and they only get paid if you win. So they're incentivized to fight tooth and nail to make sure you get the best settlement possible. So guys, if you're ever in a car accident, God forbid, and you need legal representation, then you can check out Morgan & Morgan. In just eight clicks or less, you can have America's largest accident law firm fighting by your side. So if you're interested, go to forthepeople.com slash Dantavius or dial pound law. That's pound 529 from your cell phone. Thank you to Morgan & Morgan for sponsoring this video. Now let's get back into it. That's Despite not, the extremely small book. chance of winning the grand people. prize, Pepsi There's was right flying now. off the Maybe shelves like, like, like well, like a, like a non-shitty soda. Their sales shot up by 40% overnight, so increasing their market share by a respectable 7%. And the campaign was going so well that Pepsi decided to extend it by another five weeks. Up to this point, 17 people had won the 1 million peso grand prize, but now a few more people would get the chance to become millionaires. This is when shit started to hit the fan. On May 25th, 1992, the winning number of 349 was announced on the evening news. One of the winners, Victoria, was unemployed and raising her four children off her husband's salary of just four dollars a day. That's crazy. When she saw that That's glorious crazy. 349 bottle Million cap, she damn near shit herself. She was already planning on buying a new house and putting her children through school. A few miles away, Marilee So was in a similar financial situation. She had been praying for weeks to win the grand prize so she could finally escape the crippling poverty she was living in. Her husband had spent the last of their money on a six pack of Pepsi. Luckily for them, one of those bottles happened to be a winner. They were gonna be millionaires. They could finally afford that NFT they've always wanted. But when the two women went to the Pepsi plant the next day to claim their prizes, they noticed they weren't alone. There were thousands of people gathered around the building, all holding 349 bottle caps. Well, somebody made an oopsie. 486,170 people had crowns with 349 on them. Oh my Pepsi God, this is going to get people fun. killed. They couldn't possibly give all these people a million pesos. Then how would their CEO be able to afford his third yacht? An emergency meeting was called and Pepsi's crisis management team spent all night brainstorming solutions to this colossal oopsie. They decided that as a so-called goodwill gesture, they would give everyone with the 349 bottle cap 500 pesos and an Arby's gift card. And most people actually took them up on this offer, but others were outraged. In their eyes, they won fair and square according to Pepsi's own rules, mm -hmm. and they were entitled to that money. After all, it wasn't their fault that Pepsi screwed up. Now, the thing is, this wouldn't be the only time yep. Pepsi botched one of these giveaways. <laughs> yeah. Case in point. Right. Introducing the new Pepsi Stuff Catalog. Pepsi you drink, the more great stuff you're going to get. Sure beats the bus. <laughs> yeah. In 1996, Pepsi ran an ad campaign featuring a loyalty program where you could buy merchandise from a catalog with Pepsi points, which you accrued by, of course, buying Pepsi. At the end of the commercial, it said you could redeem a Harrier jet with 7 million Pepsi points. Seven million. Clearly, this uh, was a tongue-in-cheek joke. No, nobody would be psychotic enough to actually think they could win the jet. Well, except this one guy, John Leonard, who actually got the 7 million points and sued Pepsi when they refused to give him the jet. Turns out Pepsi's legal... Don't put that shit in on, on TV or in your ad or in your commercial and say somebody can win it and then don't mean it. I mean, what the fuck? What the fuck? Mm. Stupid idiots.
legal team, which probably costs tens of millions of dollars a year, that's a forgot to put a disclaimer like said, in the commercial about this being a joke. They later it, updated yes. the commercial to say just yes, kidding in parentheses, which <laughs> pretty much like an admission of guilt. Now, John Leonard eventually lost in court because, you know, the legal team had to make up for their oopsies, so they went extra hard on him. But of course, the general public sided with him because okay. it's not really a good look for a massive corporation to be fighting some regular Joe Schmuck in court. But the whole Harrier jet controversy was nothing compared to the disaster that was about to happen in the Philippines. So let's recap. We got half a million pissed off Filipinos. At the beginning of the day, they thought they were millionaires. And over the course of a few hours, their hopes were completely dashed. It's like finding out the child you raised for years isn't even yours. Uh, you, she might America. be outside. So this all begs the question, how the heck did this even happen? Well, it turns out that 349 had already been designated as a losing number. So the Pepsi bottling plant had free reign to print buttloads of bottle caps with that number on them. But remember, Pepsi extended the competition past the original date, which messed everything up. I guess some schlemiel forgot to update it in the system or something. It's, mm. it's not exactly known, but that's the going theory. This explanation did not cut it for the thousands of people living in extreme poverty who thought their entire lives were about to change. Mm. Soon protesters started gathering around Pepsi facilities all over the Philippines. At first, it was just a few dozen, then a few hundred, and then thousands of people were out there marching, picketing, and boycotting every single day for months. One man in his 60s died of a heart attack during one of these protests and his wife later told the media, even if I die here, my ghost will fight Pepsi. <laughs> oh, that's, that's pretty badass. Hell these people yeah. were not messing around. No. At first, everything was peaceful, but then they started to turn violent. After hundreds of years of colonization and dictatorships, the people were fed up and they took out their pent up generational anger out on Pepsi. Protesters started torching delivery trucks, throwing rocks at salesmen, threatening Pepsi employees, and attacking bottling plants. I think this newspaper article from 1993 says it best. In ways that the government never could, the anti-Pepsi fever has brought together communist rebels and army generals, well-dressed Manila matrons and barefoot peasants, all holding 349 bottle caps. Pepsi executives were soiling their bridges. One of them said, As we were should. eating death threats right. for breakfast. Most of the executives were Watch relocated the out of the country, say, but the ones that weren't had to travel Maybe that's with 24 the theme of the hour armed security. <laughs> Despite all that, the corporate bigwigs in New York refused to cave to the protesters. Pepsi's VP of Public Relations, Kenneth Ross, Don't came out and said, on. we will not be held hostage Don't to extortion and to terrorism. Die. Pretty big words from a guy who was at zero risk of anything happening to him. But unfortunately for the poor schmucks at the bottom of the corporate ladder who couldn't afford a private security detail, they were risking their lives every single day for like 32 cents an hour. The attacks on Pepsi plants continued all the way through 1993. In May of that, that year, a homemade bomb was right. thrown through a window, killing three employees and injuring multiple others. The bottling plants weren't the only targets. People also often attacked Pepsi delivery trucks. When it was all said and done, around 40 trucks were destroyed, set on fire, or flipped over. And you know, the Filipinos Damn. were lucky Pepsi didn't decide to go to war over this, because they did have the sixth largest military in the world at that point. As the violence wow. continued to increase, Pepsi held firm that they would not negotiate with terrorists. But what if it wasn't terrorism? What if the NBI, which is like the Filipino version of the FBI, launched an investigation into these violent episodes that were occurring because of the 349 thing? And what they discovered was shocking. Now, keep in mind, this is all alleged. The NBI's chief of organized crime reported that the so-called terrorist actions were not actually terrorism at all, but they were perpetrated by Pepsi themselves. The chief was quoted as saying, the people responsible for the bombing, burning, and destruction of Pepsi property were hired goons of Pepsi's management. Damn, bro. George Bush on the board of Pepsi or something? And that wasn't even the only conspiracy theory. You know, in, um, in Fallout, Far, uh, Fallout 4 uh, Far Harbor, uh, there's a storyline uh, about um, the... Um, the... Uh, the uh, 
soft drink company that's on the island um, getting um, uh, assa- or basically assassinated by Nuka Cola. <coughs> and this is like this is, feels a lot like that. Maybe this is what that storyline is based off of. Senator Gloria Arroyo, who would later go on to be the president, claimed that the violence was carried out by rival bottling plants from other soda pop companies to try to get rid of the competition for good. If this is true, this is absolutely demented. I mean, we're talking about soda pop here. It's not that serious. This is like mafia stuff. But the thing with the Royal is uh, she was charged with corruption later in her career. So, you know, take what she says with a gram of salt. Anyways... As the violence continued to escalate, it wasn't just Pepsi employees that were at risk. Some innocent bystanders also got caught in the crossfire. On one occasion, somebody threw a grenade at a Pepsi truck, which bounced off and took the life of a school teacher Holy named shit. Anacita Rosario and a five-year-old girl who was just standing nearby. Six others were also seriously Holy wounded by the blast. The woman's husband, Raul, was then called into Pepsi's corporate office where they offered him $4,000 not to sue. Raul was outraged by this offer. He screamed at them, my wife wouldn't have died. It's because of the 349 incident, because you cheated the people. He would later end up accepting the settlement after being convinced by his friends and family. This kind of captures the general mood surrounding this whole fiasco. Most Filipinos blamed Pepsi for the violence, not the people actually perpetrating it. Now, I should mention that even though there were a few extreme occurrences here and there, the vast majority of protests were peaceful. Not everyone took the violent approach. And multiple coalitions were set up to try to beat Pepsi in the courtrooms rather than on the streets. The biggest of these was Coalition 349, led by Vincente Del Fierro. And get this, Pepsi actually sued him for libel and slander. He was even accused by Kenneth Ross of orchestrating the violence himself. But Vicente was far from the only one trying to sue Pepsi. There were a total of 689 lawsuits and over 2,000 criminal complaints against Pepsi. But unfortunately, Mm -hmm. none of them really went anywhere. A few people snagged a couple thousand dollars, but nothing substantial. And in 2006, after 14 years of litigation, the Philippine Supreme Court ruled that Pepsi was not liable for the damages caused by the little game. Somebody got paid. Eventually, the craziness would die down and people forgot all about the whole number fever disaster. Pepsi's sale would eventually rebound after a few years, but to this day, in some parts of the Philippines, saying the word Pepsi is like Voldemort, and a lot of people still have bad taste in their mouths over it, not just because it tastes like absolute dog shit. Well, there goes my chances of ever getting a Pepsi sponsorship. (laughs) Now before I go, I gotta say one thing. I've been shitting on Pepsi a lot in this video, and deservedly so. But I don't want you guys to think that means Coca-Cola isn't a bad company because they're just as bad, Mm -hmm. if not worse, than Pepsi. At the end of the day, five people died because of the number fever fiasco. But that pales in comparison to the amount of people who pass away from heart disease and diabetes because they can't get access to clean drinking water and are forced to drink nothing but Coca-Cola instead. You know, it's just uh, something to think about. I'll be right back. Do that tomorrow while I'm out.
Because the only thing we should have to worry about is oil changes, Bobby. Not fucking, like, doing what we'd be doing. I said, we shouldn't be having to worry about what, like, this stuff. We should just need to get it fixed. Yeah, let's just get it done. Oh yeah. Okay, so that was um, that was how um, that was how Pepsi's thirty-two billion dollar typo uh, killed five people, or probably more than that. And that was that was wow, guys. All right, so next up is um, yeah, because um, it's already twelve o'clock. I think I'm gonna like a two. two uh, what time are you uh, bouncing out of here? I have no idea. I'm gonna be awake probably most of the night. What are you gonna be doing tonight? I'll probably play a game. Uh, like what? Uh, let's see now. There is uh, the Outer Planets, uh, Fallout, 7, uh, Fallout 76. Mm -hmm. There's this Monster Hunter game that I started playing with Ashley, and it's it's got a Japanese theme to it. So Katana's freaking the uh, the spinning uh, the spinning. Uh, Umbrella of Death, bows, and pretty much usual stuff. We were, we got to the point where we were trying to unlock uh, the other three missing um, weapons, hoping that one of them was going to be a uh, two hand, or like uh, two one handed blades that you can swing around. But, um, mm. there's. We haven't unlocked that yet. The last thing that we fought was like this jumbo sized boar that I want to say is like the same size as a city, uh, city block. And it's like, no, oh, yeah, yeah, that thing's super easy, no, no problem. And and what uh, what game is this? Uh, okay, look it up real quick. Yes. Yeah, I heard you, Bobby. I'm, I'm, I'm on stream. Give me a minute. Fuck, you would have a million questions. I'll give it to you later off stream, Bobby. I'll give you to you later when I'm off stream. Okay. All right. Um, so. I'll have to give you that information when uh, I get back to the house because it's in my uh, Xbox chat. Mm -hmm. So we'll look at, um, okay, so um, this might be interesting. This is a new analog where it's called Japanese Urban Legends Rituals, Le Legends and Rituals Volume 1. It's an analog horror. Um, so and, far, so cool. Yeah, and they're short, so we can watch a couple of them. Um, 
All right. Um, I don't need the key. 